everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining in on today's uh, session, which is the third of the three-part series of neuro for neurointerventional fellows. Today, Dr. Curtis Given and Dr. Eric Peterson are going to be presenting on pipeline flex cases. The session is intended to be as engaging as possible during this time of virtual engagement. So with that being said, please utilize the call-in line to ask any live questions to either Dr. Given or Dr. Peterson. The call-in number is 833-818-2718 and can also be found at the bottom of your console. So before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, at the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools that you can use. All the engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. Um, you can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. You can also find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A engagement tool. We'll try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. Please note, we do capture all questions. This, co this course is sponsored by Medtronic Neurovascular, therefore no off-label questions are permitted. If you do have any questions that are off-label, please direct them to rs dot n-v-o-m-a at medtronic.com. So our first speaker today is Dr. Curtis Given. Dr. G Dr. Given is a neuroradiologist at Baptist Health in Lexington, Kentucky. And our second presenter is Dr. Eric Peterson. Dr. Peterson is a neurosurgeon at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami, Florida. So Dr. Given, take it away. All right, so I'm gonna try to share my screen with you all. All right. So we're gonna go through a couple uh, kind of polling questions. And uh, if you'll submit your answers as either A, B, or C into the Q&A, that's kind of how we're gonna have to track it by going through this kind of live screen look. So for example, what's your current status and fellowship, first year, second year resident? Please just answer A, B, or C in the Q&A section. Okay. What is your specialty? Again, please answer A, B, C, or D for a neurosurgeon, neuroradiologist, neurologist, or other. How many aneurysms does your, endo, your institution treat uh, endovascularly per year? Of those aneurysms, how many are treated with flow diversion? All right. So again, uh, in this, today's new normal of uh, digital uh, education, uh, this is our kind of first go at uh, how this is going to look. And so this is a learning process for us, for sure. Um, 
but uh, we're going to go through a pipeline today and uh, kind of uh, point out some some tricks that we've learned, uh, teach you some lessons we've learned the hard way, and hopefully let you learn from some of our mistakes uh, to help you in your practice going forward. Uh, as much as we can be, we want to try to be uh, interactive with this. Um, just so you guys know, I cannot see the Q&A, so if something comes up question-wise, please uh, jump in and uh, take it, Eric, or let me know. Um, but uh, uh, we'll see how this goes. And so again, this is kind of a bread and butter pipeline. You know, having this, uh, this is probably one of the first cases that, that I did, you know, several, several years ago. A large uh, ophthalmic, uh, paraclinoid kind of aneurysm, ophthalmic uh, uh, AP and lateral projections. Here's the 3Ds. Uh, you can see the relationship of the ophthalmic artery kind of down near the base, but just kind of a, a, a classic kind of a flow diverter uh, case for 2020. But when you're thinking about these aneurysms, really, you know, the question often becomes, first of all, to me, the first question I have, is this an intradural or extradural aneurysm? And, you know, from a whole, think, uh, a whole standpoint of thinking, you know, what's my real subarachnoid hemorrhage risk with this, or is this a mass effect issue with a cavernous aneurysm? If I treat it, am I going to need more than one flow diverter? Um, am I going to need any sort of adjunctive uh, devices uh, in addition to just flow diversion? Uh, is there something about the aneurysm that makes me worried that it could rupture or it's at risk for rupture? Does it have excrescences? Uh, does it have uh, lobulations? Is it a uh, perfectly round aneurysm or is it elongated? Uh, these kind of things. Does the patient have any sort of history that suggests they may have had a prior sentinel hemorrhage? So these are all kind of things to consider when you're thinking uh, treating an aneurysm, but especially uh, treating uh, with a flow diversion. So this case, again, this is probably, uh, you know, close to 10 years ago now. Uh, on the top right, you're seeing a video run after placement of one flow diverter. And uh, we went ahead and put in a second one early on, um, and you can see it resulted in much more stagnation of contrast with this. Um, so just kind of questions for you guys to try to make it a little more interactive here. When you, this aneurysm today, I don't know that I would treat it the same way, and I'll be interested to kind of skip Eric's take on this. Um, when you, when, what makes you uh, consider putting coils in an aneurysm or not? Eric, do you want to chime in, or does anyone have any questions about that? When, when would you have done multiple flow diverters with this, or would you have done flow diverter and coils? Yeah, I think I think the the main concern there, um, as you know, Curtis, but just for the audience, is is um, that you change the flow dynamics in such a way that the aneurysm ruptures w within 24 hours of placing the device, and that's almost universally fatal. So it's a big problem to make sure you're not on the, anywhere near. Um, no one really understands exactly why that happens. Um, most of the cases have been in very large aneurysms. Um, Ophthalmics have been notorious for doing this. So I think a lot of us, uh, you see an ophthalmic aneurysm that's anything over 10 or 15, really 15 millimeters. Most of us want to put a, a put coils in there. Um, so that, that's what I would do. And anytime it's anything big, big, big basilar aneurysm or some nasty thing, anything big, I always put coils in there. The, the second thing about two devices really relates to the fact that a lot of times these big aneurysms, if they're on the outer curve, um, the amount of force that's going through the stent is often too much to allow it to endothelialize and seal off. So the narrative there is that if you put a second device down, you've got enough coverage now that it negates that issue. So for big aneurysms that are on the outer curve, uh, separate from the acute rupture issue, just the idea that they're just not gonna, they're not gonna go down and you're gonna have to put another device in, in six months anyway, muscle up front do that. I think some people do that. Yeah, I agree. and and. You know, looking back, it's, it's sometimes interesting to look how your practice evolves. Um, again, just showing some uh, post-procedure uh, Dyna CTs. I think that Dyna CT is something you want to be comfortable with. I think that if there's a question about your apposition, do I have good apposition with the flow diverter? I think it's a very, very useful tool. And so I think, again, that's something that, you know, as far as being prepared and, and trying to uh, you know, minimize complications, be familiar with your Dyna CT, be familiar how to, to set up your power injectors or what dilution you like to use uh, to process these for sure. Um, 
So again, I think, I don't know if these videos, just shows the before and after the amount of stagnation with just two flow diverters. And then a 12 month follow or eight to six month and 18 month follow up, uh, a real nice technical result, aneurysm's gone. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, narrowing of the, the parent vessel just with the endothelialization, but no obstruction to flow. So again, you know, that's kind of the, the case that we all want to see. You know, that's the case that you're like, okay, I know what to do with this. Um, uh, we're talking about the, the, the flow diverters and the delayed hemorrhages. Um, you know, there's a, not a hard and fast rule, but uh, I, I kind of use uh, 14, 15 millimeters as a size as to when I'm going to consider putting coils in an intradural aneurysm. But then often it's just the morphology. If it's an aneurysm that you're like, that's a really weird looking aneurysm or has a lot of lobulations and stressances, my threshold to throw in a coil or two beforehand is very low. And if you look at some of the case series and when they analyze this, you know, the, the uh, coiling wasn't uh, necessarily associated with the delayed ruptures. Most were giant aneurysms. Uh, some were, in, you know, most were in the vascular territory. The, personally, the, the delayed hemorrhages that I've had, which is two, um, were both parenchymal hemorrhages, not subarachnoid hemorrhages, and they were both with cavernous aneurysms. And so, you know, I have my own speculation as to what that, that issue was. Uh, I will say that those were both pre-PRU testing and so it's hard to know were these people that were hypercoagulable, did they have some sort of little microemboli that uh, then turned into a hemorrhagic parenchymal infarct down the road? Uh, was there change in some hemodynamics that, uh, that they had like a hypertensive equivalent kind of hemorrhage? Um, I think that there's a lot still that we don't know as to why those happened, but I'll tell you it's been a long time since I've seen one. Eric, when's the last time you had a, a delayed hemorrhage with one of these? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting point. It, it's been a while. And I think, um, just for, again, for the fellows, like when Curtis and I started doing this stuff, the device was significantly more challenging to deploy. Um, and uh, there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of dragging the stent, resheathing, trashing it, new stent. And I think that the endothelium just got smashed. And I think that um, you ended up with just a significantly higher thromboembolic load um, and that relates to, to, to how that happens. I mean, I, all of my complications have gone down now that I'm like really good at deploying it and it's like one and done almost always. Um, I gotta believe that the device changes that they've done have categorically decreased the amount of messing around that you're doing up there and, and that's where it comes from. But you're right, it, it's really tough to know where that really came from, no one really knows. Yeah, I think as, you know, as a general rule in neurointerventional procedures, not, you know, you don't want to rush things, but in general, you know, the longer a case takes, the, the more likely you're, you know, that the, you're increasing your risk of uh, complications for sure. And certainly deploying newer, the newer pipelines, pipeline flex is, is completely different than having to deal with a, a five millimeter pipeline classic, for example. Um, so this is a different kind of, uh, an additional ophthalmic aneurysm, elongated. This is one that, uh, Oh, okay, so those slides didn't make it. Um, well, uh, uh, this is one that I chose to uh, include some adjunctive therapy with it uh, and threw a couple of coils in. Um, so flow diverters, one of the big things uh, is definitely wall apposition. Um, I think it's very easy early on to be like, okay, I deployed it, man, okay. I'm done with that. I'm gonna, you know, it looks pretty good. I'm gonna leave it alone. I don't wanna do anything else. Um, it scares me a lot when I go to proctor people and they say they're not comfortable, if they say they're not comfortable with balloons. Um, because I think that you, if you're not comfortable with balloons, then you really should think, okay, do I need to be putting in a flow diverter? Because if you don't have good wall apposition, there's lots of tricks that you may have to do but one of those may be put a balloon up to do a little angioplasty to try to improve your wall apposition. Now that doesn't mean it's always going to work, but again, 
I think that you, you your, your risk of thromboembolic complications, your risk of heron artery shutdown, your risk of perforator injury, your risk of an endo leak is all going to be significantly higher without wall acquisition. So you can do different things. Again, I encourage people to definitely do Dyna CTs when you're not sure about wall acquisition, to run the microcatheter through with a J-tip, uh, to run your intermediate catheter through now that we have uh, intermediate catheters that are very good with that. Uh, don't be afraid to use a balloon. Again, if you're if you're concerned, use a balloon. And then um, definitely Eric probably can comment on this too, but uh, you'll go through a phase where you try to get cute and use shorter devices um, and definitely went through that phase. And so we weren't necessarily uh, having, uh, you know, uh, pipeline going from healthy artery to healthy artery to re really have a good apposition. And so uh, all of these things you really need to pay attention to. And this is kind of a, 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 you know, a case that is a disaster with classic, and this is with pipeline classic, but the, it's one that needs to be treated. You know, you have this large symptomatic uh, cavernous aneurysm. You've got uh, a, a real nice kink here in the mid-cervical carotid that's going to pose you some... Uh, some problems, you've got this giant aneurysm. To get around this aneurysm and get through the inflow to the outflow can be a challenge. And this is one that we had to loop around the artery, that we loop around the aneurysm several times to get out the outflow and then reduce that loop. Once you do that, the interesting thing about this kind of aneurysm is we deploy the, the pipeline and you can see it's, it's not ex expanded here. We balloon it and now we're seeing stagnant contrast within the aneurysm. And so I'm like, great, you know, it's already taken me an hour to get to the outflow to get through this. I'm like, that looks good. I do a Dyna CT and I'm, I'm happy with that position. But what you notice, this aneurysm is so big that it's actually compressed the carotid. The, if you look at the size of the carotid canal on the contralateral side, and the size of the device here, while there's wall apposition, the carotid is being compressed by the aneurysm. If you look at the bottom run here, the bottom rows here, as we follow through the angiographic run, we have great stagnation in the, in the, in the aneurysm. So I'm high five and I'm like, wow, okay, I really know what I'm doing. I was able to loop around this giant aneurysm. I was able to deploy this long pipeline classic device. I'm super happy, I'm done. I get the follow-up CTA in six months, and the aneurysm still fills. I do an angiogram, and you can see there's a little jet of contrast coming alongside the pipeline device, filling the aneurysm. Now, the aneurysm is much smaller, but you can see that there's clearly no longer wall apposition here. And what's happened is, as the aneurysm has thrombosed some, the artery has tried to get bigger again, but the pipeline didn't have apposition there anymore. And so what was apposition in a, a, a vessel is now no longer apposition. And there's some other, there's some things you can try to do that uh, we'll talk, I'll talk about in a second, but obviously this needs to be treated again. So ballooned the whole thing first, <clears throat> and then I went ahead and put another device further uh, down, go more proximal to make sure again, to have good apposition and try to steal off that endo leak. And this is what it looked like immediately afterwards, still a little bit of a jet. The initial after the second treatment and then a 12 month follow-up, there's a tiny little bit there, but on the subsequent CTAs that went away at 18 months, 24 months, I finally got to the point where I was like, I can't angio you anymore. If it looks good on the CT, we'll be good. Her, her cranial nerve palsy improved, so she was happy. Uh, I figured this is about as good as I'm gonna get with this. The thing about, uh, and you can see here how the apposition is with just a little bit of that at the 12 month follow-up after the second treatment. So, you know, this always is a question of, of and I'll, I'll see what Eric says too. Again, I'm making him work on my presentation. <laughs> probably more than he wanted, but uh, nice. um, uh, you know, this is part of the debate of should you give vasodilators uh, before you deploy flow diverters? And the question is, you know, do you make the artery bigger than it normally would be, or do you make it as big as it should be to ensure your apposition, 
But then in this case, I don't think it would matter because there was kind of a mass effect that was going to probably, you know, was going to be a problem and need an additional treatment, in my opinion, regardless. But uh, Eric, what do you think about float, uh, 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 vasodilators? Yeah, I think the, the main risk is um, is that you see unrecognized spasm, that the vessel is spasmed down a little bit. It's not obvious. You miss it. You put in a stent size to that spasmed diameter. You do the uh, forbidden post-deployment fist bump, high five, whatever, in the angio suite. And then <clears throat> when you're driving home, you get called to the patient is plegic and a stroke call is, is, stroke code is called because now the vaso narrowing, uh, the, the um, spasm is resolved. The, the vessel went back up to its nominal diameter and your stent is now not opposed. You have an endo leak, clot, and mayhem. So I think the, the answer to your question is that you should have a very low threshold for putting it in. Um, if I see any sort of spasm from the guide down here, which oftentimes there is, depending on what you're putting up there, I usually will just say, hey, look, just treat it. Even if this doesn't look bad, it does propagate. People don't think about that, but you'll see spasm in the cavern. The cavernous will be smaller if you've got cervical spasm, it, even if it doesn't look anything like the raggedy cervical spasm you have, it does propagate. So mm -hmm. it's, it's low risk to put it in unless you're um, at five and a quarter already in size. And you're like, wow, I'm not going to be able to get a five million or cent in here. And you're worried about it dilating up to 5.3 when you definitely can't put it in. Um, it's low risk to do. Um, and so that's how I think about it, I guess. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so do you, so I, I don't routinely uh, give uh, vasodilators unless they're spasm. So, uh, but I know some people give it, you know, prophylactically. Do you give it prophylactically yeah. or do you just give it if you I, see spasm? Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that. Some people do it every single time to prevent that problem. I think that's reasonable, um, but no, I don't do that. If it's a clean cath and it looks good and the neck looks good, then I don't give it. But if there's even the slightest question, I always do it. Um, and I always remeasure again, post, you know, messing around just to make extra sure that it hasn't gone down or gone off a little bit to catch that spasm. Um, so uh, another thing that's kind of always a, a question is, what do you do about kind of side branches that may be coming out of the base of the aneurysm? And this, you know, mostly applies with kind of ophthalmic aneurysms, but then also PCOM aneurysms can be an issue with this as well. Um, in general, we like to think that if a blood vessel needs to stay open, it will. Uh, that laying a, a flow diverter across a vessel that needs to stay open will stay open. So, for example, the anterior choroidal artery, you can lay a pipeline across it with very, very low risk. If you lay the pipeline across the ophthalmic artery, if it needs to stay open, it'll stay open. If it doesn't need to stay open, meaning that it's, there's a rich collateral network from the external, it will often shut down. But this can also have implications on whether the aneurysm thrombosis or not. And so, again, this is that case from the beginning that I showed that, giant, you know, near giant aneurysm that had the ophthalmic kind of coming out of the base of the aneurysm. You can see on the six-month follow-up, the ophthalmic is extremely small compared to the size that it was. But when you shoot the common run down here on the bottom, I've got a red arrow, you can still see there's a very good retinal blush just from the uh, external, uh, external carotid collaterals taking over. Uh, and, and, and filling the, uh, perfusing the ophthalmic artery. And so patient's completely asymptomatic from this. Um, no issues at all, no blurred vision, no floaters, anything. And so again, this is just an example where the ophthalmic did not need to stay open. And, and so the collaterals took over and it, it shut down. This aneurysm though, is this nasty bilobed aneurysm uh, the ophthalmic's coming out the, the, the top lobe. You can see right there how the ophthalmic's coming out of the base of it. Uh, put in a flow diverter, and on its follow-up, the bottom lobe has thrombosed. The top lobe is extremely small. It's shrunk down and is mostly thrombosed, but there's still this residual kind of, you know, five millimeter uh, neck remnant that's staying open because the ophthalmic is coming from it. And so it's serving as a siphon. And that, that, that can be a difficult thing. I'll show you my next case where I've chased that and put in another pipeline and then put in another pipeline. And it still fills. And I'm like, okay, the, the, the choice here is I can fix your aneurysm and keep putting this in until the artery occludes, 
uh, the parent artery maybe it occludes or the ophthalmic artery occludes, but at what risk to your vision? And that's a real unsatisfying thing. Patients don't like to hear their aneurysm still fills. They're going through this to have the satisfaction of hearing you say, your aneurysm's gone, it's cured, you don't need follow-up anymore, this is of no more risk. Um, again, even on the follow-up, again, this aneurysm that I just showed, there's still always this little nubbin. And what's the hemorrhage risk of that? I think it's very low, um, but again, it's not zero, and it, the patients, you can't tell them your aneurysm's gone and gone forever. Um, this is the example of this case is just like an albatross to me. It just uh, will not go away. This very irregular, elongated, you know, irregular shaped uh, uh, supraclonoid aneurysm, ophthalmic artery coming out of the base of it, real wide neck. Put in a first flow diverter and uh, understand this is a great thing. And I think I saw a peek to Eric's slides. He'll probably talk about this. Where pipeline and flow diverters land initially is not where they may end up being. This is like a slinky that's slightly under, you know, that even being deployed, especially with classic device, um, that, uh, that the ends of it are still under a little bit of traction. And as it wants to expand to, it, uh, to its size, the ends can retract a little bit. And so prior to even uh, being done with this case, this uh, first pipeline device was up here, but once we had recaptured and gone back through, the device had, had pulled back um, and is barely covering, if, if not, it's not completely covering the aneurysm. So we went back through and put a second one in to anchor more distally. And again, this is, don't be cute. Go ahead and make sure you have plenty of landing zone because these devices can migrate uh, for sure. It's not as much an issue with pipeline uh, flex because you can really compact that more and really uh, expand the device better than we could with classic, but uh, don't get cute. So this, uh, thought this looked good, did our, our Dyna CT, uh, uh, didn't put that on here, I guess. Uh, but uh, at eight month follow-up, there's stagnant contrast within the aneurysm. But if you watch the right, it's very slow to fill but if you watch the run, contrast will just circle back through the aneurysm to supply the ophthalmic artery, which then filled late. So took her off her plavix, had her only on aspirin, brought her back at 14 months, same thing. The aneurysm slow to fill, circles around to fill the ophthalmic late in the run. She wants her aneurysm fixed. She doesn't wanna have an aneurysm. So bring her back and put a third pipeline in, overlapping all of these. You can see on the Dyna CT here, brought it back way proximal, went even further distal. There's some calcium in the dome of the aneurysm. Uh, on this uh, little uh, Dyna CT looking through again, we have great coverage of the aneurysm. Um, there's no, so great apposition coming around the genu, coming up neck of aneurysm, the aneurysm is covered. This is not an endo leak. This is filling through the, the struts of the through the struts of the device to supply the ophthalmic artery. So this is what she is. Bring her back, put, after that third treatment, after the third pipeline device is put in, this is what her angiogram looked like afterwards. Hardly, just very late in the run, just a little bit of contrast filling. So I'm like, yes, home run, finally fixed her. I hated that the ophthalmic shut down, so kept her on heparin overnight in the hospital in addition to her plavix and aspirin. She had no visual complaints, went home the next day. You know, I tell her, hey, I think we finally got this. We finally won. Bring her back at six months, only on aspirin, not on plavix and do the run, the aneurysm fills, contrast swirls around the aneurysm to supply the ophthalmic artery. And I'm like, okay, what now? You've got three pipelines, at least two and a half layers of them covering the neck of the aneurysm. This is just something that's not going to be cured with this. And at this point, I'm thinking, oh God, if I would have just thrown a couple of coils in the dome of this at the beginning with the first one, 
this wouldn't be, you know, this would be, wouldn't be happening. Um, and so here's her three year follow up after her third pipeline. There's, you know, calcium in the dome, the aneurysm still fills. And so this is just the, the one of those cases where you're like, I have not helped this lady. Um, you know, what's her rupture risk? I think it's exceptionally low. Um, I think the pressure in this aneurysm is very low, but I don't think that that, you know, is a, not an absolute. That doesn't guarantee her that she can't rupture from this. And again, it was an aneurysm. I didn't like the shape of it beforehand. She's pretty much, you know, she'll come back for her CTAs, but she's pretty much told me, you know, she's had her treatments. Um, I've uh, taken her off of aspirin now, and so I'm hoping that even off of aspirin three years out, that this will uh, thrombose. But I think it's always going to fill because I think her ophthalmic artery is always going to demand blood flow because her external can't support it, and it's always going to keep, you know, a, a sump. Uh, through the struts of the device to supply the aneurysm. Eric, what do you think about that? How could I fix that? Um, remind me, did she have visual symptoms when her ophthalmic shut down? She did not. You mean after the third treatment? You have three stents in there? There's three stents now. Yeah, I mean, as you know, once you put one stent in, you're done with any other treatment other than another stent. So. Um, yeah, I mean, once you've done that, it's kind of tough to you need to go much more than three. I don't know, I wouldn't have done more than three. Um, but yeah, do you put coils in the beginning? You know, tough to know. Yeah, I mean, hindsight, yes. If I, I bet you, if I would have put one or two coils in that with one pipeline at the beginning, this would have never been an issue. But I, I think it highlights the fact that if you have these, you know, uh, branches out of the base of the aneurysm. If the body needs those branches to stay open, that may also serve as a as a sump to perfuse the aneurysm as well. I've seen that yeah, with peak pumps. Yeah, absolutely. The, the fetal PCA is a non-starter for pipeline. It just doesn't work. It, it does a really tough case. It's large, you know, peak aneurysms with a large fetal, true fetal, right? No P1. True fetal PCA arising from the neck is not going to go down with a device. Um, those really should be treated with surgery or some other kind of maneuvers. I think this is my last case that uh, that they that they're letting me show. <laughs> um, but small aneurysms, uh, you know, it's it's. I think it sometimes was hard to think why am I going to use a pipeline or a flow diverter on a small aneurysm, and I think that that's uh, an era of if you ever had to push a GDC coil in a three millimeter aneurysm, you would know that that is very much one of the highest pucker factor cases um, because that you know you're there's especially old school gdc coils you had no train you had no real tactile feel of what's the tension you were feeling as you're hooking a hemostat to the end of the coil wire to push it um, is that tension in the aneurysm or is that tension in the microcatheter you just didn't know and certainly coil technology you know this is an aneurysm that can absolutely be coiled but the, the risk of rupturing this aneurysm with coiling is, is significantly higher than the risk of rupturing this aneurysm with a flow diverter. And so it's one of those things where uh, my threshold to flow divert small carotid aneurysms versus coiling has gotten much, much lower because the devices and the technology has gotten so much better. Uh, again, Flex is just a, a great device to deploy that the, I think that the risk of uh, complication is uh, is lower uh, today with uh, flow diverters than coiling for these little aneurysms. And that's certainly controversial and, you know, everyone, not every, it's not a hard and fast rule. Do I still coil these kind of aneurysms? Absolutely, but flow diverter is in, on my radar and, and thinking about that. And so again, you know, a single device, uh, pre and post, uh, aneurysms gone. You know, hard to, hard to beat that result. Yeah, the only comment I would have there for the fellows is there's a tremendous amount of momentum once you get into practice to treat small unruptured aneurysms, which a lot of people feel the rupture risk of those untreated is practically zero. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of push being like, oh, just throw in a quick pipeline because it's easy and safe. And the premier data shows that the risks are low, which is true. But you're, you're 
the whole, the entire rationale is that you're taking rupture risk off the table. And if the treatment risk is low, but your rupture risk is almost zero, man, just be careful there because um, there's going to be a lot of pressure. There's a lot of people being trained. Most people are only doing stroke. There's going to be a lot of pressure to do aneurysms. You're going to get a tasty three millimeter thing and you're like, oh, maybe I should, eh, the risks are low. Like that is a dark place. Just avoid that like the plague. And um, okay. But I, I agree completely with Curtis. If you think an aneurysm should be treated, the small ones are, are much, much easier. If you don't even have to get into them, you just stay in the parent vessel. But again, pipelining normal vessels is, is easy, right? For a reason. Um, let me see here. Hello, good guys. Full screen. I'm not seeing it yet. Now okay. I am. Yeah. You got it. It's a little yes. delayed. Okay. So I'm going to bust through this. Uh, Curtis did a great job as always. And uh, if I'm repeating some of the stuff, forgive me, I'll, I'll, I'll move it along. Um, so uh, this is a very basic uh, uh, aneurysm case, uh, AP and lateral there, um, wide necks, SHA aneurysm, five millimeter neck. Um, and I think for me, this is this is a, a, a pipeline case one, two, and three choices, right? Um, and I think one of the, the first things that I like to think about for these is people jump into, well, let, let's just get going. But I think it's important to understand the first thing that they do when they show up. There's going to be a lot of things you guys are going to run into. So this is the first thing I, I would talk about is, you know, what measure they need ahead of time. You all know what they need. Um, and just on the, the sharing of the, or just type in an answer. Let's suppose you're all ready to go. The patient shows up and, and she's like, oh, oh I, did, I didn't know that Plavix was, was true. I thought it was just the aspirin. I thought it was one or the other and aspirin is free. So I just, I use aspirin. Well, what do you do with that? Patient's there in pre-op, ready to go, but didn't take her Plavix at all. All she's taking is aspirin. What do you, what do you guys do in your shops for that? Curtis, you want to read? So I can't read any of the responses. You want to read yeah. all the answers? I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing any responses yet. Um, so I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll chime, I'll chime so, in with my uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Oh, so in our, you know, if in our institution, if a patient had come from long ways away, if they've come from two, three hours away, um, we probably would load that patient with Berlenta uh, just because of the uh, low incidence of resistance and the quick hour action of onset. And, and treat the patient. That's not a hard and fast rule, and that's not uh, you know necessarily what I would advise you doing in, in you know your first five, ten cases. I think that's something that comes with comfort because what you don't want to have on your first couple cases is have variables, add variables to cases that you don't need to add. And the other thing is you have to question patient compliance in that issue. If you told them take Plavix and aspirin and then they stopped their Plavix before they showed up, you have to wonder, are they going to take their Plavix afterwards? And so, yeah. you know, those are all kind of little red flags. Yeah, yeah, those are both really good points. Um, and he's right, man, when you first get started, like keep everything perfect, be slow, don't worry about being fast, just get everything right and, and try to minimize the risk as much as possible because you're gonna be hurting a lot of people. Um, but I agree, I, for us, you know, Berlinta has been a game changer for us. Like it has completely stopped the scenario or solve the scenario of this where someone shows up, they haven't taken it. Um, it's just a non-starter. We just put them on the Berlinta. The, the key things to know is that Berlinta is therapeutic in two hours. So super fast. So we don't even slow down or tell them to check. And, you know, we just give them the stuff in pre-op. And by the time at least our hospital anesthesia gets started, you get the access system up and you're ready to deploy the stent. You're at two hours. So we don't change anything at all. Um, the two things to know about that drug are the biggest one by far is that it is very expensive. Plavix is a generic essentially, and it's very cheap. So um, for this scenario, it's not a big deal. You just can transition them outpatient after a week or so onto Plavix. Um, but uh, if they can't take Plavix because they're resistant or whatever, and you're putting them on Berlinta, you've got to solve that because they're not going to pay 600 bucks a month uh, for some of these patients as their rent, and that's a big problem. Um, the second thing to know about Berlinta is that it is unlike Plavix is 95% protein bound, meaning and has a five day half life. So if you give, or it takes five days to get out of your system. So if you give platelets to somebody that is on Plavix, 
you stop the Plavix and give them platelets, those platelets are chewed up and inactivated by the Plavix that's still in the body within like an hour um, versus Brilinta has a very short half-life. So if someone comes in with a bleed and they're on Brilinta, all you have to do is stop the Brilinta and just give them the platelets and boom, they're, they're, they're reversed, which is not the case with Plavix. So if there's any sort of question on a ruptured case or some sort of urgent issue where you're worried about maybe even have to reverse, Berlinta is almost like an oral antiplatelet heparin kind of thing where you can just turn it off and give platelets, whereas Plavix is much harder. Um, but just be aware because Berlinta really solved a lot of problems. Someone comes in with a had a neck tumor and they want a quick covered stent done, just bring them in, throw the Berlinta in an hour before and drop the stent. It really does make this much easier. Um, I'm going to skip through this quickly. This used to be a really big deal. What do you do with the Verify now? Um, just our bias here, as long as it's uh, less than 200, I just keep going. If it's greater than 200, I don't even think about it. I just put them on the Berlinta and switch them over. Um, I don't worry about low numbers and all that stuff. I probably should, but I but I don't. Um, again, someone comes in with a uh, Verify Nav 220, no discussion, no discussion with the family. You just swap them out to Berlinta and keep the case going. Um, so I don't know why any of these, of course, it looks like none of the, uh, the builds here are, are going in this PowerPoint. So unfortunately you're, gonna have to, you're seeing all my answers at once, but so the tech asks what to open, right? And I think this is the first step that people are talking about the pipeline and where to deploy it and what's my push pull and all this nonsense, but they don't even have the setup right. So the first thing you should think about is, okay, what am I gonna have the tech open, right? So you guys should all be saying right now in your, in your heads, okay, the tech asked me what I wanna do for this case, what's my setup? What are you gonna tell them? What are you gonna put in the leg? What are you gonna put in the wrist? What are you going to put in the neck? What's your system? What's your intermediate, et cetera? Um, you'd be amazed that out in proctoring, how many people will be like, oh, yeah, I'm just going up with a fire French envoy. And that, that's just profound misunderstanding of neurointervention in general, much less what it takes to put a pipeline in there. Um, and the reason for that is that you need something that's much more supportive, right? Um, and this is why, right? Uh, the the flow diversion stents are completely different from the other stents that you may be playing with, right? So, so why is that? What's different about Enterprise and Neuroform and Atlas, Solitaire, whatever else you've been doing versus Pipeline? Everyone just think about that for 30 seconds. What is the difference between Pipeline and basically everything else here? So the answer is that it is a braided stent, right? So these are what the braids look like on the left there, you know, like they're, they're basically braided together and then it, you can push them and pull them and the whole things move on top of each other. Um, the one on the middle and the right are laser cut stents, which means it's a big tube that the laser literally just cuts away all of the metal and leaves the metal there to have the stent. So the key thing about this is when you look at a stent and you put it into the little loader system that gets it into your microcatheter, the laser cut stents, in order to get them from this diameter to this diameter, you just squeeze them and the whole thing radially compresses and the length of the stent doesn't change, right? So that's how you get them into the microcatheter. The braided stents like pipeline, it is not true. You can't just radially compress them. You can, but they have to be stretched out for that to work, right? So if you have a stent that's this long, open, in order to get it into the microcatheter, you have to stretch it all the way out like a Chinese finger cuffs. That's how you get it into the microsystem. And what that means is that natural state is to go back to its compressed form. So when you're sitting in the microcatheter and you're trying to push the stent out, the stent is by definition maximally stretched out. It's always stretched out. That's the way you got it in there. So the only way to get it out is you have to recapitulate what you did to get it in, which means you cannot just unsheath it like a laser cut stent. You have to reverse the stretching, which means you have to push it out. All of the nonsense about pipeline is boiled down to that one fact. <laughs> so make sure you understand it. It is a braided stent that is stretched in the loading system and you have to reverse the stretching by pushing it. That is what explains why pipeline is so different from everything else. And once you know that, someone made it, made it through my fellowship with my fellowship director not teaching me that, but the guys at NYU have a ton of great stuff on this and they explain all this to me. Um, once you know that, it explains all sorts of weirdness that happens when you're deploying the stent, right? So you can see here on the left, when you first start your deployment, um, you can see how the stent is kind of restrained, constrained at the tip there, right? And as soon as that tip thing, in this case, this is the old uh, capture coil nonsense, but the PT face leaves we have now is the same there, same scenario. As long as that thing is constrained, it's gonna look a little bit stretched like that. And then at some point it'll 
pop loose from that tip and then it will compact back to where it wants to go, which is what you look like on the right. So when you first start your landing zone, let's suppose this aneurysm here, you're like, okay, I want to land it, this looks at the aneurysm, but I want to have the stent probably not cover that PCOM, although I have to say nowadays I don't care about that, but let's suppose you wanted to land it just proximal to that. You have to account for that pop and then release back to its normal state at the initial deployment, right? So you want to aim the whole thing to be right at, or maybe just a little bit distal to that target vessel, that you're trying to avoid coverage because then you know when it pops open, it's gonna retract back to perfect. If you try to land it at perfect on the right picture there, when it opens and pops back, it's gonna pop back even further and you're gonna miss your landing zone, right? Braided stent stretched out, right? Here's what this looks like uh, for the pipeline flex. Instead of that little capture coil, you've got these like PTFE sleeves here, which are kind of essentially a, a better version of that to hold the device. The whole point of that is, as you can see here, the distal end of the stent has these kind of rough wires that are literally just poking around. So if you push that whole stent up through the microcatheter, it's gonna, those wires are gonna dig into the PTFE liners of the catheter. So the PTFE sleeves here fold over the stent like this, so you can push the whole stent up through without digging into it. That's also the reason why if you uh, push the system too far out into the blood vessel without the PTFE sleeves, the, the stent wires are gonna dig into the endothelium. Um, as soon as you deploy the stent a little bit, you want those PTFE sleeves to pop off so that the stent can open, all right? Um, now you can see here, number two, what happens if I just did a pure unsheathing, like I treated it just like a neuroform or I treated it just like a solitaire stent where I just did a pin and unsheath, you're gonna end up with a situation on the left where the whole system is way too stretched out. And as soon as it releases the slightest bit off the wall here, this whole system is going to flip back to its native state, which is this, and you're going to once again miss your landing zone, right? So this whole system here is stretched out. So when you put it in there, you can't just deploy it. You have to push it out to recapitulate and reverse the stretch nature that the Medtronic guys did when I had to mount it into the stent or into the uh, device. Um, so here's what that looks like um, as you're start initially starting to. to, to to push the stent out, you start with an unsheathing just to get the stent out, and then you rapidly change to literally pushing the whole stent out, right? Um, and what that means is that the whole time you're deploying the stent, you're loading the system. So if you look at just in the body, you're pushing the whole time. So you can't just keep loading and loading and loading, right? Like it, it's not going up into the brain, like indefinitely, but the end of the stent is stuck on the vessel. So if you just keep adding load, the, the catheters start to push on the outer parts of all the curvatures of the vessels, and at some point you have to fix that, right? So this is what'll happen eventually. You'll put the stent out and you'll start pushing. And then at some point, the shape of the stent will transition from this nice cozy uh, shape here to this crimped position. And this means you've got too much load. You see this here? This is too much. So in this case, yes, you wanna to continue to push the stent out, but because you've added so much load to the system, you've overloaded the system. So how do you, how do you keep deploying the stent with pushing without adding any more load. Well, you push out stent until you see something that looks kind of like this shape. You stop pushing, you pin the wire, and you just deload the entire system out. And once you've deloaded enough of it, then you can go back to pushing. So the whole time, the stent is only being deployed by pushing, but you can't just add load forever. You have to add load by pushing stent out, then deload the whole system, push some more out, deload. So it's this kind of stepwise fashion. How do you know? when to deload it is because of this shape. If it doesn't look like this shape, if it looks like this shape, then you have to stop loading, you'll just crimp it. If it looks good, you can just keep loading. Even if you're like, wow, I've been really loading for a while, go by the shape. You'd be amazed at how, how much that will tell you. And then number two is how much do you deload? So you see this shape, how much do I pull back here from the leg or from the guide sheath before I know it's enough and I can go back to pushing? The answer is this bump here, will be jammed on this outer curve. You have to pull load out of the system, out of the system, out of the system, out of the system, until this pulls off the outer curve. The original classic teaching was that you would want this to be pulled all the way to midpoint in the vessel. I think that's actually a little bit underloaded at that point, so I don't pull it that much. I usually pull it till I just see it starting to flop or maybe 10 to 20% inside, and then I just go back to pushing wire. I find that if I deload it all the way to here, and push wire, I end up falling back quicker and the device ends up being a little bit more stretched than I like. But there's no question that until you see this thing bouncing off this wall and, and not being pinned anymore, and it's out at least to here, you can't just keep pushing, all right? Talked about this. Here's the shape I mentioned. This is too much push, right? So in addition to that crimping part, if you see the shape of that stent, instead of it looking like 
this nice little kind of triangle shape if it looks like this this is too much you can see how the whole system is almost trying to intersuscept here right and if you keep pushing you're literally going to intersuscept the stents so that's too much stop what you're doing deload all this you can see how much load we've got here the whole system is on outer curve here outer curve here you know how much load it is pull until this comes off of here pull until this comes off of here a little bit and then go back to pushing all right here's the opposite problem if you just pin and unsheath it, the stent will stretch out like this. And you can see I've got too little load here. See, it's all pulled back to the inner curve here, pulled back to the inner curve here, and the shape of the stent doesn't look like this nice shape here. It's way too underloaded and stretched out. They call it the champagne flute. It's too little load. So by looking at where your catheter is on the inner and outer curves and by looking at the shape of the stent, that should tell you whether you've got pushing or pulling to do next, all right? In general, I find that the device works better the more load you put on it. It tends to open up better with more pushing. So you really want to have maximal support up there and, and in general be more aggressive with pushing it out um, until you see this picture. As soon as you see this, stop. That's too much. Deload it a little bit and then go back to pushing. Um, the other reason why this is important is that it means that the stent is lazy. It's very difficult to open this thing up. You often have to whip this back and forth to get this to open, etc. Um, and it is a lot of messing around, but in general, it's actually relatively easy to do. And I consider it still to be one of the, except for maybe a fistula repair, to be one of the most fun things to be able to do because there's a lot of moving parts going around. And if you get it right and you get good at it, um, it allows you a level of control over a device and intervention that you almost never get with almost anything else. Um, so it tends to be very satisfying. And this is a quote from, again, the NYU website a while back that I saw as a fellow that I thought was just so apropos. So I'm just gonna share it here. Uh, by the time you are comfortable with the feedback from the device shape and its packing based on the loads you're applying, you will find yourself ready to vary things according to your specific intentions, at which point drops of rewarding endogenous endorphins may be added to the sea of adrenaline, which is the usual state during the pipeline deployment. Um, and that's true. I mean, it is a little anxiety provoking because there's a lot going on here, but it, it, once you get good at it and you master all the things we just went through, it, it, it is awesome. Um, okay, so this is a, a cakewalk anatomy, right? You've got a huge distal landing zone here, nice straight MCA, nice non-kinked in the neck, massive bend here, that's easy. And number two, this posterior genu is not high, it's low, right? It's almost like a pediatric genu. This, a monkey could put a pipeline into this. Sometimes the genu can be much higher and you've got to go up and then back down, right? So this is a significantly easier case. So when you look at these anatomies, the first thing you should be looking at is, okay, is this an easy pipe case or a hard pipe case? And the aneurysm itself is almost totally irrelevant. What you're looking for is your proximal landing zone, your distal landing zone, and then the tortuosity between here and the body and up here that's going to take to push the stent through. That's what you need to look at. Um, so in this case, this is a high riding gen you see on the left. That is significantly harder than what's happening on the right. And the reason is that what happens is if you have a, uh, a device that's around this bend here, when you push from here, the device tends to back up even though you're pushing, right? So if you see my fingers here on the screen, when you're pushing like this, it pushes up against that bend and it paradoxically backs out of the brain as you advance more in the neck, right? And that can be extremely confusing. You're sitting there zoomed in on the head and you're pushing, but everything's backing out and you have no idea why. You think of my losing access in the art somewhere. This is why it's this high riding genu. And there's a very specific fix for this, right? So what's that fix? Well, here's what's happening, right? You've got your, this Alex Coon put this stuff up a while back when he was still at Hopkins, but if you advance here, you can see the whole system starts to back out. You get this reverse paradoxical sim effect, right? The fix for that is to get your, your intermediate catheter has to be up and over the bend. So your intermediate catheter, whatever you're using, we use Navian obviously, but there's lots of choices here. Whatever you would get for your intermediate catheter, if you have a pediatric arch, or sorry, genu like this, you don't need to have it up there. You could put that through five French envoy maybe, but anytime you have the, any sort of a tortuosity here like this, your Navian has to be up and around this bend to here because it then can fix this problem. Otherwise you're gonna be sintuing it and you're not gonna be able to deploy the stent very well. So your intermediate catheter, I do it every case anyway, as a matter of practice, should always be anterior cavernous. But in a new case like this, that's tough. It absolutely has to get up there. I don't care what it takes. If you have to track up a fathom or a big system just to be able to get the, the intermediate up there, you should not be pushing stent and trying to deploy stent until your intermediate is around here. A lot of times, 
when you have on your AP here, if there's a kink there and you can't quite get the nabbing to go around, lots of times when you load everything to put this up there and you start pulling back the microcatheter to start dragging back your stent, often that pulling will straighten this out and the nabbing will climb over this last bit, but you really should not go to pushing stent out until your nabbing is around uh, this bend down to here. Um, and then the second thing to think about is what's proximal to the injury. And if you've got a 360 loop in the neck, again, you're going to need a lot of support. All of the bends from the leg or the hand all the way up to the brain and the stent, it's cumulative, right? So if you're pushing down from the leg or pushing the stent wire and you have a 360 loop in the neck, you have to get through that 360 loop and all the forces that have to then be transmitted to the carotid siphon. You've got a tough posterior kink like this, and that's going to suck up force. So all of your transmission force loads to the stent are going to get sucked up by all this stuff between you and the stent. So the more torturous it is, the harder it's going to be. So when you see an arch like this with a loop like this, you see a posterior genu like this on the left here, all of that in your mind should be like, man, that's going to be a tough case. Those bends are going to suck up a lot of my force, and I'm not going to get the stent to open very well because it's not going to feel anything I'm transmitting to the wire. All that means is more support. Put your guide higher up. Get your guide around this bend. Your intermediate farther up. Sometimes you have to put your intermediate all the way around the aneurysm into the M1 just to be able to straighten everything out. But the fix for all of these problems is more support, which usually just means your intermediate catheter and guide are farther up. The catheter placement, um, again, sorry, my errors here didn't, didn't look at, work out too well, but where you want your 027 is out here, right? You want it out in the MCA M2. You don't want it here. And the reason is that the PTFE sleeves are here, this wire, is much longer than you think. You put the thing in, you're like, oh, it doesn't look that long. But when you're zoomed in here, that little wire thing goes way the hell out past the tip of the, the stent. So if you put your microcatheter here, or an aneurysm here, you think, oh, that's plenty. You start pushing your stent up, and then your stent tip is like here, not even where you really want to deploy it yet, and already your wire is out. And now, in order to continue to deploy the stent, you have to push wire empty, again, with no protection into a bifurcation. And how are you going to get into one of these uh, branches? It's not steerable. You're just jamming against this. So that's no good. You want to direct the wire into the correct M2. And there's no way to steer that thing. So the only way to do it is to pre-catheterize your 027, not here, but in the M2. It doesn't really matter how far out it gets in the M2, but you have to be past here. Because once you're past here, then you know that when you push your wire up, your stent up, the wire is going to go into the correct M2 and it's parked in some big, long, nice, big open M2 and not poking against the bifurcation. The second thing is even though you think you're nice and distal, you put your 027 microcatheter here by mistake, you think you're on the other side of the aneurysm, and then as you start to push up the stent, the thing is stiff and you start losing access a little bit. And now your microcatheter starts backing up a little bit and backing up and backing up and backing up. And by the time you get the pipeline even down to here, now your microcatheter is back almost to the aneurysm. And now you've got to trash the catheter and the stent, total nightmare and go back up again. None of that is, is, is going to happen if you just put the 027 out in the M2. So if it does back out a little bit or even a lot, you've still got plenty of room, right? So just as a matter of habit, park your 027 into the biggest M2 and the straightest M2 you can find every single time. And then the second thing here is just to point out your intermediate catheter should be distal cavernous carotid every time. There's no point in having intermediate and having the intermediate sitting down here. You might as well not even be using it. So 027 goes here, intermediate goes here. All right, so the best view, uh, what do you need to see? Well, you don't need to see the neck. Unlike everything else, when you're doing aneurysms here, you don't really care about the neck. What you want to see is the distal landing zone and the proximal landing zone. So here's the distal landing zone. You want to have that nice and laid out. You don't want this to be foreshortened. So spin your 3D around, make sure it's laid out in front of you like the basilar. You don't want to be looking down the barrel. Now, uh, number two, your proximal landing zone. These are ortho orthogonal to each other, right? So if you, whatever view you have for this, now you're looking down the barrel of the uh, cavernous, right? So that's not going to work for your proximal and vice versa for the lateral. You can see a nice view of the proximal landing zone and lateral, but the AP, sorry, the distal landing zone is foreshortened. So almost always it's some sort of AP to see the distal landing zone and a good view on the lateral to see the, the proximal landing zone. You need both. Um, and then the second thing is that it's often easy to not include the MCA candelabra and bifurcation in your view, but you need that, right? You need to be able to see as you go up with your microcatheter that you're catheterizing the M2. If you zoom in like this, all of a sudden you're going up with your microcatheter, you finally navigate past the aneurysm, and then you realize, crap, I don't even have the rest of the M2s in my, my view. I can't see it. So your view should not should have all of this in it. And the classic error is to center your view on the aneurysm 
the aneurysm is not relevant, right? You want the distal proximal landing zone and the MCA bifurcation. None of this space down here is relevant. So if you had this thing centered here, all you would care about is all the stuff to the right and this huge open space to the left on the screen you're not using. So don't center on the aneurysm. You should be centering essentially on this M1 and making sure that you've got proximal landing zone, aneurysm, distal landing zone, M1 and MCA bifurcation, and a little bit of the M2 all in your view. So it's, what you really want is your, your ICA, your uh, aneurysm centered down here somewhere so that you can have all this other stuff there, all right? All right, am I all ready to go? Not yet, sizing, right? So you've got your view here finally, you're all ready to go. The sizing you wanna pick is, um, is really this and, and this, right? And, and the most important part there is just to make sure that your proximal sizing is accurate, right? The stent only comes in one size and this size is different than this size. So which one do you size it to? You always size it to the proximal one. It doesn't matter if you have a little bit of wall opposition, uh, lack of wall opposition distally, but proximally it's a big problem. Like, so that is what you really care about. So if this is three and a half and this is five, you're gonna put in a five, right? You're not gonna matter what this is. The only thing to know there is that if you end up having that much of a size mismatch where it goes from three down to five, the stent here is gonna be putting a five millimeter stent in a three millimeter vessel, and it's gonna be a little bit elongated, right? You're gonna get some length there because the stent will be not very deployed and you're gonna end up way more proximal than you thought you needed to be simply because the stent didn't uh, uh, expand well, so it didn't contract well. So you end up with a little bit longer stent than you thought you would end up with. And that can be a problem for these large cavernous injuries or cavernous carotids, because if you land it here and this is let's say five, and then you don't measure down here, it turns out this is actually 5.25, and then this is 5.4. Basically, if you land your stent here or earlier, you're gonna have an endo leak. You cannot put in a pipeline big enough to solve that problem. So when you put in your stents, number one, make sure that you account for the size mismatching if it happens, and then by putting a shorter stent, right? So if this whole thing measures out to be, oh, 18 millimeters will drop me perfect, but you've got a size mismatch, then you should put in a 14 or a 16. Number two, you should definitely measure it here where you want to land it, but assume that you're going to screw it up and it's going to be more proximal. And you need to know what these lengths are. If these lengths are still okay for your stent sizing, then great. But if you all of a sudden happen to jump up in this patient to 5.3 or 5.4, you know there is no way you can land a stent this distal or this proximal. It can't be done. You're going to have an endo leak. So then you should undersize even more to make damn sure you're nice and far away from that. And when you're deploying the stent, if you're like ready to kind of do the final deployment at the end and it looks like your stent is hanging out down here. That's, you have to know ahead of time, hey, I cannot deploy down here. I'm gonna have an endo leak, resheat and redeploy. So you have to know where you think you're gonna land it, but measure approximately a couple centimeters and measure the distance here to make sure you know what the width is here. Um, this is just a view of, of uh, another type of case I was doing. Um, and I, what I would ask you guys is, what do you think about this case for a pipeline? What, what's, what's easy, what's not easy? I'll give you guys a second to think about it. And, and while they're thinking about that, Eric, do you use any of the simulations to size or do you do it at the monitor? Like, you know, they have all these new programs, 3D programs to simulate the size. Do you find those useful or? No. I, I don't either, I just wondered. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I've trying. been doing those before and I've been like, this is solving a problem that I don't have. But, you know, they're nice, okay. but again, you can size on this. Um, so a couple of things. So number one, I'll play this again. The, um, it seems straightforward, right? Relatively small aneurysm, um, vessels look okay, nothing crazy going on there. But a couple of things that are challenging about this, number one, this JNU is high riding, right? So it, as soon as you see this, you're like, okay, well, that's not terrible, but this is not a chip shot pediatric JNU. This is high, your, your intermediate, your Navian is gonna definitely have to be around this bend. You want it to be down here when you're deploying. Number two, on the other side of the aneurysm, this bump here, this is not normal, right? The aneurysm doesn't, the aneurysm doesn't end here. This is not the distal neck. This is the distal neck. So like Curtis said, normal to normal, you can't deploy your pipeline from here. It's gotta be at least to here. And then it's gotta go down to the other side of normal. So this is still aneurysm and all abnormal and all has to be covered. And you can see you don't have that much of a, a landing zone, right? You could easily miss this depending on how good you are at deploying. So you're going to want to think to yourself, okay, how big of a deal is this if I have to land it in the M1? Um, spasm near the guide, we talked about that, uh, how to do the roadmap. I talked about this briefly, um, how to prep the pipeline. Um, okay, so when you first come out, uh, the, the, your microcatheter is up here, your O2-7 is up here, you're pushing your stent up. 
probably push your distal stent up to around here. The wire of the stent will be way out here, but it's nice and oops, it's nice and safe out here in the M2. So you're gonna first unsheath, right? Unsheath your 027 back here until maybe you get, if this is the tip of your stent, unsheath until maybe you get around here. This is how I do it. They used to teaching, oh, unsheath a good centimeter or two and then transition to pushing. I've stopped doing that. I, I As soon as I get the catheter back to around the dip, distal end of the stent or maybe a little bit more, I pretty early transition to just a hard, not hard, but a relatively firm push, <laughs> right? I don't keep on sheathing, none of this 50, 50, 80, 20, none of that, just a pure 100% push. Because what you want to have happen is you want to push those PTFH sleeves off the end of the stent. You really want to get that distal stent to open. The first challenge is always getting the PTFH sleeves off, getting the stent to open, and load helps both. Stretching it does not. So I've, oh, I've become more and more biased towards more load at the beginning of the deployment to help that problem. Some people do like a drop right where they want to do that. I still am old fashioned. I, I like to have it look nice and neat and open purely here in the M1. Then I, dra I drag it back. As you get the stent to start to open, it's just load, 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 load until there's too much load. And you see this picture and then you deload the catheter, right? Not the wire. So you, if you go and look at my hands here, <clears throat> you've got uh, for me, my left hand's on the micro catheter RHV, my right hand's on the wire. So I'm just loading stent until I add eh, too much load. Then I tighten the RHV, and with my left hand, I slide up to where the microcatheter is going into the intermediate catheter RHV. I undo the RHV there. Two hands, very precise deloading, right? You, uh, Moran taught me this a while back. I think it's one of the best tips ever for pipeline. When you're deloading the microcatheter in between your pushing epochs, do it with two hands. Don't get cute with this one-handed nonsense. You're not that good at it, and you're just also gonna gonna deload too much, and the whole system is gonna fall back. There's no rush. The device is already super fast to deploy. Use two hands, millimeter by millimeter, submillimeter by millimeter. If it's too much, you can add more. Much harder to do with, with one hand. Once you get there, retighten the RHV, go back to the wire, loosen it, go back to pushing, right? Once you get it out a little bit, sometimes it still doesn't open, even with a fair bit of load. So one thing that actually helps because it's a braid is you can actually like whip it a little bit and you can get it to actually open up a little bit. Um, is this a video here? Oh man, an awesome video here. Anyway, this guy just got to whip, whips the thing and <laughs> basically even if you're pushing the thing out and you can't get the stent to act, the braids are actually kind of stuck a little bit and they just need to be kind of loosened so that they can then open up and just literally whipping it or wagging the stent. What all that means is you're basically taking the RHV with the microcatheter, you tighten it around the wire, Put your hands on the microcatheter and you're just pushing forward and pulling back pushing forward pulling back and and the microcatheter will be pushed on the outer curve and pulled back and you're basically doing this to try to get the stent to open and it will open up maybe a little bit better but then when you go back to deploying with the push it will open up a lot better so that's another lever you can pull in addition to just loading is to try to just whip the stent open a little bit okay at the end once everything's deployed and you're at the last like centimeter or two used to be a big issue, like, oh my God, what if it doesn't actually open well, right? And that's a big issue. If you unsheath the end of the stent and the stent stays crimped, now you're hosed, right? You can't get blood in there at all. The whole system's gonna go down and you have no way of getting in. In general, that really has become significantly less common. So um, I still end up, when I'm loading the stent, pushing it out the whole way, when I get to the last centimeter, I tend to deload a little bit of it just to get it out so I don't have a bunch of crimping at the very end when the stent doesn't have a lot of support. And that last centimeter, I just do a relatively rapid unsheath just to let the system pop open. And what'll happen always is it'll look like this. And then all of a sudden you won't even be able to notice it either by trying to climb back up or just moving a millimeter. The whole system will pop open and retract a lot, like a centimeter. And you won't even notice it because this is almost always down in the skull base and the peach's bone is in the way and it's tough to see it. But just expect that. So if you're trying to land it here, you should expect your stent tip to be around here and it will eventually end up here, right? So what I do is I do a rapid unsheath at the very end and I immediately keep my wire pinned. My left hand goes back to the microcatheter. I just advance the microcatheter to now climb back up. And when you unsheath, it will climb back up, bump the stent open and then climb and start to bump the stent even more. Climb that all the way up to the MCA to recapture. That process alone does like 95% of the opening of the stent, right? Then you just pull that micro wire back into the system. The PTV sleeves will invert and pull in. The, the, the PTV sleeves are attached extremely strongly. You should try next time you do a pipeline just on the back table. Try it when you're done. Just try ripping off one of those PTV sleeves. It's not easy. And I say that because when you pull the wire to pull the PTV sleeves back in, it's a fair bit of force. And you're thinking to yourself, man, this is above 
what is normally a reasonable amount of force to be doing on any device and anything in your intervention. But for this, it's okay. Just keep pulling, it will come out. If you get that nervous and you've got good access and the stent looks great and you're on plenty side of the of landing zones, you can just pull the whole microsystem out if you want it, all right? Once you're done, you're almost done, except for this, you really wanna make sure that the stent is completely opposed. Um, I rarely do balloons, I agree with Curtis. If you're not comfortable with balloons, not only should you not be doing pipeline, you should not even be doing an intervention. That just makes no sense. But if you, if you are looking at the stent, you have to assume that it's not deployed completely, right? You have to assume that it's just not quite radially expanded enough. And remember that the, the, the device wants to constrict and expand, right? This is natural state. If you look at a pipeline on the back table, it doesn't look like this. It's this super tight, slinky looking thing. So what that means is, in addition to radially expanding it, you actually want to try to compact it a little bit. That's what gets you the natural state. So that's why I don't like balloons as a first step, because all they're doing is radially forcing the stent open, whereas the J angioplasty, which you see here, does both. It's got a J, so it does radial expansion, but because you're pushing it through the stent, the stent is going to compact also from here to here, let's say. So you're doing both dimensions of what it is needed to do to get the stent to be naturally at its, its most expanded state. I'd say maybe 10, 20% of the time, I don't run back to the stent without the JWR. I just do it in almost every case. If I look really clearly at it and it really does look perfectly opposed, then then I'll just say, okay, fine, we can skip the JWR. But almost always, I run back up there with the J angioplasty at least once. All right. Um, this is a video just showing all that together. Let's get through this here. That same injury we talked about, and you can see there, nice high riding genu, horrific amount of spasm, right? That looks awful. I don't know what my fellow is doing, but obviously not the right thing to do. So that needs needs a ton of rapid mill for sure. Um, here's your your lateral view that you can see here, right? That's your your view to see the proximal landing zone. Get up and catheterize, and again, you can see there I got my intermediate catheter. You don't want it down here. It's got to be up and over, right? So you can see here, I try to actually push it, and I'm just trying to get more purchase to get that intermediate around. This is what always happens. See that huge shelf there between the Navian and the 027? That's digging into the, the delium, and it's stuck because it's trying to make a 180 bend. So eventually, you have to try to push it around. Then you can see there, I actually can't get it. I'm like, ah, I'm forcing this too much. I'm not going to force this anymore. In this case, what you're going to do is you know that when you push the stent up there, you know that when you pull back on the microcatheter to start deploying the stent, it's gonna straighten out the whole system. Just like when you pull a solitaire back and everything straightens out and the guy starts climbing, it's the same thing. So when you get to this scenario here, where you just cannot quite get the Navian to climb anymore, just yeah. stop. We got the wire, put up the stent, and then when you deploy the stent, see that? As soon as, as, soon as my stent's up into position, as soon as I start, there, my stent is up. Now I'm pulling it back to unsheath it and deploy the stent. I'm pulling back my 027. Watch what happens. You can see the load coming out of the 027 there. And watch what happens to the Navi with no pushing, just on its own, deploying, it comes up and around, right? So always be patient. If, it, if you're deploying the 027, pulling it back and deploying the stent like this, and the Navi does not finally climb over, just give it a little bit more load, it'll climb. But don't force it at this stage with the 027 and the micro wire. That is a mistake. Just do enough as you can. If it doesn't quite go, just leave it there parked and loaded, put up the stent. And then when you start deploying the stent, the Navian will climb around like this. Happens in every single case. In fact, a lot of times it ends up climbing too much. So don't force that first one for no reason, all right? Anyway, deploy the stent. I'll show you in the AP what this looks like better, but here in the lateral, we'll just see the finish. Um, see how that stent looks a little stretched right there? That's, that shape is really important. You can see the initial unsheathing right here, right? You don't see a whole lot of distal stent opening, right? You can't see the PTV sleeves, they're not really opaque, but you know that the stent isn't really open well, you know those PTV sleeves are not open. And you see here, even there, the whole stent is that champagne, champagne flute stretched appearance. That is not enough, right? There's not enough load here. So you can see I end up loading the whole system, pushing some more. So you see what I'm doing here? I'm actually pushing microcatheter, right? So I'm pushing wire this whole time, but it's not enough load. The, the pushing the wire is there's not enough microcatheter support for me to get away with pushing just wire. The stent isn't getting pushed hard enough. So you can see on the inner curve there where the Navian is, right, right here. 
this microcatheter is not fully loaded to here. So as soon as I see this not working, I'm like, wait a minute, we don't have enough load here. The stent's not respecting this. We've got to load more here, and then I can try pushing. So the first thing I do is I push the, I pin the wire and I push the whole microsystem to add load to the entire system. So right there, see that? See that? I go from here, mid position in the artery to there. That's what you want. And you can see what happens to the stent. Look what happens in the middle of the stent. It's that narrow, and then as soon as I load, it goes to that. So just loading this, the catheter allows the stent to open better. And now with that increased load, now I maybe have enough that when I push stent wire, boom, now the whole thing is opening much better. And then I decide, oh, the tip is, see here, it looks much better how it's open, but look at the tip, it's still pinned and constrained. So I decide, okay, well, even though this looks good, I still have that distal part right by the end of the wire. I've got to get that to open. So I decide to climb back up over the whole thing and push those PTPCs off and redo it again. So you can see that happening and now it opens up. It's still pinned, but it looks much better, right? Again, more load, right? Again, see, I've got not enough load that's stretched, but then load, and now I push wire. So this, this microcatheter back and forth, these are two different positions. This is deloaded wire or catheter, I mean. This is loaded. So if you push wire from this position, it's gonna come out stretched. If you push wire from this position, you're gonna be able to get a nice opening. So the, the position of the microcatheter in the vessel, you've gotta be a master of this. You've gotta immediately notice, oh, this is loaded, this is deloaded. You have to know what's happening here. Don't get intoxicated by that happening in the stent. You gotta look in the microcatheter. And now you can see it's almost getting too much load, right? Like look what's happening right there. See, it's starting to kind of look crimped almost, almost like that, that, uh, that glass I showed you, it's too much, so then what I do, I deload, right? See, I pull microcatheter back, right? I've got it on the outer curve, now it's in the middle, and now I go back to pushing wire. And now look how easy, how nicely the stent opens up. See that kind of perfect middle ground? And then again, same thing here. I push stent, and again, I've added load, and now it's too much. See how it's starting to crimp right there? It's too much. So I stop pushing wire, I, grab, I pin it, and I grab the microcatheter, and I deload the micro to that. See, I'm going from this to this, now I go back to wire, push wire, and now it opens up pretty nicely. And again, same thing, it's crimped again. I stop pushing wire, I go back to my catheter, I deload it to middle vessel, see this? Boom, boom, deload it, then go back to pushing wire. And some people are like, oh my God, you're almost near the Navian, who cares? Just deploy in the Navian, it's not gonna do anything. Just back up the Navian later if you want it, and then you can deploy it there. That looks really nice. Now I back up my Navian a little bit. I try to keep on the other side of that genu if I can. Keep pushing again, this is too loaded. I deload the micro a little bit, push wire, and you can see this kind of back and forth with the load of the microcatheter, looking at the shape of the stent is how you deploy these pipelines. And in no case is the same, it's always looking at the stent and the shape, all right? And again, you can see here, I'm pretty much near the end, right? The point of no return is right there. So if I decide here that eh, I don't like it, this is the time to resheath. You can't resheath much more than here. You're not gonna get much of a grip on it. So I always take a look in my head and say, uh, am I good with this? Is this what I want, right? Because this is your last chance. And again, if this is where the end of the stent is right here, you know it's going to end up another centimeter or so before that. It's going to end up way down here once it opens. See how stretched out the proximal part of the stent is? That's going to all compact, and you're going to end up way down where the carotid cavernous is. And you can see again here, I unsheath it, boom, stent pops open, and then when I climb back up, I immediately pin wire and climb back up with my OG7 like this, the stent drops even further, pull out my wire, and then I do a run. You can see there, you look on the native first. You want to look right, the magnet view lights off right there. Look there for the stent and the contrast goes right up to it. That looks great. And then you look on the other side, right here. You wanna look at the stent, and then as the contrast goes through frame by frame, you wanna see the contrast goes exactly up to the wall. Then you know you're totally opposed. If it isn't, then you go up with the J wire. Um, here's what that looks like. You basically just J the wire beforehand, and you push the wire through with the support of that catheter like this, and you push that J through, and the whole system uh, opens up the stent a little bit better. All right, clear as mud. <laughs> Uh, let me see what this is. Yeah, this is just the AP. I'm just gonna skip through and just show you again your view here. When you're deploying, this is not a great centering that we did here, right? Like you'd wanna see this down here. All this space is a total waste. None of this is useful. This aneurysm should be down here so that I can see all of this, right? And then the only point here is just showing the beginning when I push up my stent, see how again, Look how long that wire is, right? And it's really much longer than you think because you're so zoomed in. So you really don't have a lot of room to be jamming wire out there. And you can see in this case, we probably should have had our microcatheter tip out here. So I could have pushed that wire up this way more. So, so I would say less than ideal for sure. Um, and you can see why with that stent wire, it really sticks way, way the hell out there. So then I unsheath here 
And then once I get a little bit on sheet, then I start pushing. And you can see here, this has not opened very well, right? We talked about that before. All this stuff is opening better here, but this really doesn't. You still have the two PTFE sleeves on either side like this. And that's why I do that extra messing around with extra loading to try to pop the stent open. And I do get it to pop open. You can see here, it actually looks much better here, but this is not released from the PTFE sleeve. So I decided to resheet the whole thing to get those PTFCs off completely. I go back up. And then when you push this time, uh, it tends to open a lot better. And again, you can see here, I'm kind of in M1 right there and I want to drop it in the ICA. So I plan on this retracting a little bit before then. I know it's going to go from this to fully open and it's going to retract to perfect, hopefully. So I'm trying to say, let's plan on this and it should retract just to here. And that's exactly what happens. You see it's distal there, but there it starts to, re it, the stent opens, releases and retracts. And now it's just at the distal ICA, which is what we wanted. All right. Uh, troubleshooting, in general, more support solves almost all the issues. Device tracking, the device won't open, you're missing the landing. It's almost all easier with more support. Remember what your max support option is, which is you know, a big uh, system in the neck, then putting your intermediate all the way through the aneurysm into the M1, putting your navbing in the M1, putting your Phenom 044 in the M1, and then just inching off 044, 027, 044, 027. That's going to give you a lot more support and will fix all sorts of nonsense that's happening. If anything is happening, the device isn't do it going well. Any issue, the first, second, and third step should be max out your support. Um, another thing that is important to understand how to fix this is if, if you have your wire out in the M2 and you're tracking up your uh, Phenom 027, but it will not go. It keeps getting stuck uh, in the ophthalmic artery ostea, or it keeps tracking into the aneurysm, and you cannot get the the uh, 027 to track over the synchro. What do you do in that scenario? Your wire is out into like the M6, it's so far out there and you just cannot, the wire is just not enough support for the O27 to track. So what you do is you leave your wire there and you open up another wire to put inside the O27 next to the synchro, that's called the buddy wire technique. What is the wire that fits inside the Phenom O27 with the synchro? You need a 10 wire, right? Synchro 10. So you should not be doing pipeline if you don't have a synchro 10 on the shelf. You shouldn't be doing it if you don't have balloons on the shelf, all that stuff. Um, you need a 10 wire. As soon as you see the 027 starting to herniate or do anything weird, just immediately ask for the 10 wire. Say, just get that in the room and don't open it yet. And then as soon as you give it one or two more tries, say enough of this, give me the 10 wire. You put the 10 wire next to the synchro wire inside the 027. That will track up. And now you've got out in the M2, pardon me, not just the synchro, but you've got a, another synchro 10 out there, two wires, and that is a big enough of a railroad to then track your 027. This is what that looks like in the video. This is this crappy blown out nastiness. I've got my wire way, way up there, and watch what happens. I'm even tracked around with the 027, but watch what happens to this blown out aneurysm here. See, the force just, it's on the outer curve. I just can't track it, right? I'm actually past it, but the amount of force it takes to track the 027, there's no vessel wall here to force it where it needs to be. I try bringing up my Navian further, none of it works. That just adds more support proximally, which makes the system even, even worse. So the, the whole problem here is that I don't have a strong enough railroad to support the track of the wire of the, of the micro catheter. So you just immediately open up your 10 wire. Now you can see here, I've got both the 10 wire going up there. Now that you got the 10 wire up in the MCA, my distal uh, micro catheter is right here. And then as soon as that's up there, then when you advance, look at that, it climbs up there and it wants to, uh, it wants to herniate into the aneurysm, but not nearly as much because you've got more support. And as soon as you're past there, you take all the wires out and just pursue the deployment. Buddy wire, 10 wire, synchro 10, synchro 10, synchro standard inside the 027. Uh, can't really tell if the device is open. Um, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, we deployed part of it, but it doesn't look good. Just resheat it. We talked about the resheathing. The, the main mode of resheathing is that you first load the system and then you pull wire, right? It's not like a stent retriever where you just pull the whole system and kind of advance the microcat at the same same time. It's a braided stent, remember it's stretched out. So you cannot just pin and advance microcatheter. You actually have to load the microcatheter first and get it on the outer curve like this and then stop and just pull wire. And what will happen is the 027 will just magically climb up over the stent. That's how you do the resheathing. You don't just advance and pull. You, load first, then pull wire. Uh, talked about this, talked about this. 
and my last slide, you know, in general, respect the device. It is a revolutionary device, but it's really not to be underestimated. There's a lot of things that can go wrong during the procedure. Plan ahead, cervical carotid, carotid siphon, aneurysm, plan for the complex anatomy. It's all cumulative. Um, go slow, really slow. There's a lot going on. It's tough to look at the AP, the lateral, the stent, the guide, the Navian. Is it open? Is it not open? Is your wire in a, a lenticular stride, perping, and you're not paying attention? There's just a lot of places to look at. There's like six or seven at once that you're supposed to keep track of. And the big error there is to go too fast because you just can't see it. Um, I had one proctoring I was doing with this, this person. I've never seen this before. Curtis, tell me if you've seen this. She had a biplane, right? And she refused to use biplane. She would use a plane, <laughs> the a plane, and then use lateral, hit lateral when she's looking lateral, but refused to do both and like rapidly. I mean, I've never even heard of that before, but that again makes no sense. There's a lot of moving parts there. Go slow, pay attention. If there's at any point a thing where you're like, I'm not sure what's going on, stop what you're doing, do a single shot. A single shot should be an automatic thing ready to go on your foot pedal. We have our program, so you just press the top left pedal and it does a single shot. All of this stuff is almost always in the future's phone. You get lost, you can't see what's going on. You mistake bone for stent edge and you totally misconstrue what's going on. Stop what you're doing, just do a single shot. And if you hear your rep or your pipeline proctor, whoever it is, goes, mm, let's stop here and do a single shot. That's code for you're screwing something up big time and you need to stop. And I don't want to get in the way of your ego, so I'm going to tell you to do a single shot. Your response to that should be like, Sounds like a great idea. Let's do a single shot. There's literally no downside and all sorts of benefits. All right. Uh, this, we don't need to show. Yep, that's it. Thanks, guys. Sorry, I ran over. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, if anyone has any questions, now's the time to type them into that question box uh, for these positions. Eric, I'll ask a question. What do you yeah. do with uh, intimal hyperplasia? Do you see that much with pipeline? Uh, I haven't, and in general, I'm extremely conservative. You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've never seen anybody come back with instant stenosis and have a stroke, never. Um, and I, I don't do probably enough for that to be a, a reasonable, you know, impressive number, but in general, like I, anytime someone has some, if they, if they have a little bit of like re on their sixth month or their one year, I might leave them on plyvex a little bit longer than some crappy data that that helps that, but I definitely don't go back up in angioplasty or any of that unless they've had a stroke. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you, you you might see a peak around somewhere around, you know, four to six months or so. It almost always gets better, improves on its own, and, and rarely is symptomatic. And so I think yeah. we keep them on Plavix and aspirin because it makes us feel better that if they do have a stroke, we say, well, it wasn't because we didn't have them on Plavix and aspirin. Um, right, they're like but, optimized, uh, yeah. I can't recall ever treating it uh, uh, more than conservatively. Yeah. Someone's got a good question here about troubleshooting and general approach for antiplatelets and pipeline slash emergent pipeline. We talked about the general approach for pipeline, like everyone just gets, you know, seven days of astrum plavix and if they're resistant, they get Berlinta. Emergent pipeline, same thing. I mean, I think Berlinta has really changed things in my practice. So there's not a whole lot of emergent pipeline, to be honest. But, uh, you know, if, if you do think that's something that it's important, then, um, you know, I've really moved away from um, doing IA, Rio Pro, or, or any of these things. Uh, for the most part, Berlinta has changed all that. So I would I would uh, have them take pipe Berlinta, like, literally in, in the pre-op area right before we put the stent in. Um, or if it's in the middle of the case for some reason, then just have anesthesia drop a NG tube and put the pipeline in and give them a, you know, a short... Um, half loading dose bolus of the integralin or whatever you're going to use because in two hours the part that prevent is going to work um i guess that's what i do yeah and typically that's 180 of berlenta and then 90 bid is that what you do yeah yeah the dose is 90 bid and the load the two hour the load that gets some therapeutic in two hours is one, just a double dose once of 180 and then in general it's supposed to be baby aspirin i think that's um, in vitro data, but there's some data that the uh, full dose aspirin does a slight inactivation of the Brilinta. So technically, uh, some people think that Brilinta should go with baby aspirin. So that's what we do. Yeah, agree. All right. 
So if we have no more questions, uh, I'd just like to thank both Dr. Given and Dr. Peterson for presenting today and thank everyone for the engaging discussion. Um, if there are any other comments or questions regarding this program that did not get answered today, we will be in contact with you to get you those answers. So thank you all for joining today and have a great afternoon. Thanks, guys. Thank you.